This is NTD Evening News. Live from our NTD Global Headquarters in New York City, here is Tiffany Meyer. Good evening and thank you for joining us tonight. A top Iranian general has reportedly been killed after an airstrike on Iran's consulate in Syria. The Iranian regime blames Israel and warns of a possible response. Syrian and Iranian officials said it was an Israeli airstrike that demolished Iran's consulate building in Damascus, the capital of Syria, earlier today. They reported that the attack killed two Iranian generals and five officers, including a top commander of Iran's Revolutionary Guard Corps. That group is a U.S.-designated terrorist organization. Iran's ambassador to Syria was in the main embassy building next to the consulate. He claimed that the consulate building was targeted with six missiles from Israel's F-35 warplanes. Iran's foreign ministry warned that the regime could respond with, quote, reciprocal measures. Israel refused to comment on the reports. The White House said it's aware of the reports and is looking into them. And Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu underwent surgery for a hernia yesterday that his office said was found during a routine exam. A hospital director said the surgery was successful and that Netanyahu is in good health. Ahead of the procedure, Netanyahu said he plans to be back in action very quickly. NTD's Jeremy Sandberg has the latest in the Israel-Hamas war. Israel's army released video on Sunday of weapons found in Gaza's largest hospital, Al-Shifa. The military said it withdrew forces Monday after a two-week operation. The IDF says troops fought terrorists in and around the medical compound, seized intelligence documents, and found weapons hidden in pillows, hospital beds, ceilings, and walls. Israel's Prime Minister Netanyahu, ahead of hernia surgery Sunday, said he had approved the IDF plan for Rafah to destroy the last Hamas battalions there. Over half of Gaza's population is sheltering in the border city with Egypt. Netanyahu said the IDF is ready to evacuate civilians and provide humanitarian aid. Four anonymous U.S. and Israeli officials told Axios the U.S. and Israel are expected to hold a virtual meeting on Monday to discuss the Biden administration's alternative plan. The IDF Sunday said an airstrike in Lebanon killed a Hezbollah commander of an anti-tank missile unit. Israel says it has killed around 25 members of the unit, including at least three commanders. The Bank of Israel on Sunday warned of economic damage if more Orthodox Jewish men don't join the military. Orthodox Jews have been exempt from military service since the founding of Israel. The central bank said the war's economic burden had sharply increased the amount of service days for conscripts and reservists. Protesters in Tel Aviv over the weekend demanded a full hostage release, some calling for Netanyahu's removal. Israeli police Saturday said 16 were arrested for disruption of traffic and road blockages. Thousands in Jerusalem demonstrated Sunday against Netanyahu and against military exemptions granted to Orthodox men. Police broke up a bonfire roadblock in Jerusalem Sunday night. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. Congress reconvenes next week and House Speaker Mike Johnson has set his party's priorities despite threats to his gavel. Our Washington correspondent Luis Martinez has more on the Speaker's tentative plan. Speaker Mike Johnson has already announced that on April 10th he will send articles of impeachment against Secretary of Homeland Security Alejandro Mayorkas to the Senate. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer has promised to swear in senators as jurors the day after receiving the articles of impeachment and begin the first impeachment trial of a cabinet member since 1876. Up next in the Speaker's agenda is aid to Ukraine. The Speaker is facing pressure from the White House, the Senate and even some House Republicans to put Ukraine aid to a vote on the House floor. We are at a critical uh, point. Uh, the um, CIA director, the Secretary of Defense, everybody has made it clear that, that we are at a critical juncture uh, on the ground that is beginning to be able to impact not only morale of the Ukrainians that are fighting, but also their ability to fight. Uh, Putin knows this. Speaker Mike Johnson insists that the $95 billion Senate-approved supplemental aid package, which was approved back in February, remains dead on arrival. Instead, he insists on a supplemental aid bill led by the House. The Speaker suggested a weapons loan program to Ukraine and to use foreign Russian frozen assets to fund any supplemental aid package. During a visit to Kiev in March, Senator Lindsey Graham promoted the new alternative. I've learned that there's $380 billion of Russian sovereign wealth assets frozen, $200 billion are in Belgium, and we need to get that money to help Ukraine and help ourselves. So I told the president, I'm all in for helping Ukraine, 
but we have to do it in a form of a loan. Speaker Mike Johnson has also suggested that he would ask the Biden administration to put an end to the LNG export moratorium in order to consider a supplemental aid package for Ukraine. Reporting from Washington, D.C., Luis Eduardo Martinez, NTD News. Illegal immigrants charged with storming the border now reportedly being released from detention. This as more details are now emerging about a legally dubious program with direct flights into the U.S. NTD's Ariane Pazdar has a border update. So far, over 380,000 asylum seekers flew directly into the United States. That's from countries such as Venezuela, Cuba, Haiti and others. Now, this is part of a program started by the Biden administration last fall. Now, the administration does not disclose in which cities these flights land. But just on Monday, a new report showed that almost all of them head to Florida. And that's despite the fact that the state already sued the government to end the program. Todd Benzman is a senior fellow with the Center for Immigration Studies. He released the Monday report stating that of the over 380,000 people, more than 320,000 landed in the Republican-led state of Florida. Now, even local officials often don't have exact numbers regarding these arrivals. Benzman's report states that officials could use the information to financially plan for their care or petition the federal government to stop the flights. The information could also help states like Texas and Florida in their lawsuit to end the program. The Biden administration also has a corresponding program for land border entries, which allows migrants Any to questions? schedule their entry via the CBP-1 app. Benzman recently told me those programs are the main reason for the record high numbers of people entering the U.S. As CBP-1 is predicated on Customs and Border Protection stamping approvals for every one of them. So you could stop those stamps of approval with an order mm -hmm. in 20 seconds. We're no longer stamping anybody. The program's over. And in other immigration-related news, a Texas judge reportedly released some of the illegal immigrants accused of storming the border. The El Paso Times reports that the judge said the local district attorney's office did not file the paperwork in time. It's not clear if the ruling applied to those accused of assaulting troops or just those charged with rioting. And lastly, eight Chinese migrants have been found dead off the coast of Mexico. That's after the boat they traveled in capsized. Only one person survived. Mexican authorities are now investigating together with the Chinese embassy in Mexico. Arian Pastar, NTD News. Turning our attention now to the collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge, Baltimore authorities are working to open a temporary channel to allow commercially essential vessels to enter and exit the port. This says crews are working around the clock on cleanup and salvage operations. The work did not stop surveying the area. The work did not stop on environmental monitoring. The work did not stop in developing better images of the wreckage so we can move forward in a safe and efficient way. Bridge collapsed last Tuesday morning after a cargo ship crashed into it. Officials said six construction workers fell into the water, but only two bodies have been recovered so far. Authorities believe four others are trapped underwater in the tangle of steel and concrete, which crews are working to remove right now. Meanwhile, the White House said President Biden will travel to Baltimore and meet with local officials on Friday. The president has vowed to use federal funds to rebuild the bridge. Easter at the White House isn't without some controversy, despite President Biden now denying responsibility for proclaiming a transgender holiday on Easter Sunday. NTD's White House correspondent Iris Tao has more. President Jones. Despite all the celebrations and the Easter egg roll, controversies are growing. And President Biden on Monday said, quote, I didn't do that, about backlash over his proclamation of a transgender day of visibility on Easter Sunday. That proclamation sparked outrage from Christians and conservatives, including House Speaker Mike Johnson, who says it betrayed the central tenet of Easter. House Speaker Johnson, who Biden today called thoroughly uninformed for criticizing him, hit back after Biden's denial, posting on X, a picture of the proclamation with Biden's own name asking, quote, this you. The White House, meanwhile, insisting that it's a coincidence that these two dates fell on the same day. Watch. Easter falls on different Sundays, right, every year. 
and this year it happened to coincide with trans, uh, Transgender Visibility Day. Former President Trump, meanwhile, called on Biden to apologize to Catholics and Christians across the country, further criticizing the White House for prohibiting children from submitting religious Easter egg designs. The White House, meanwhile, again pushed back, saying that rule for Easter egg design submissions has been in place for years. And as we now enter April, Trump is focusing on campaigning in key swing states. This week, he will be in the key battleground states of Wisconsin and Michigan. And today, I asked the Biden campaign about what their message Messages to voters who are not buying President Biden's policies on the border, the economy, and immigration issues that former President Trump is expected to focus on. Watch. I think the message that is, regardless of the issue, whether it's the economy, whether it's our fundamental rights and freedoms, whether it's our democracy, uh, the choice is very clear. The person who is fighting for you on those issues is Joe Biden. And this week in Michigan, Trump says he will highlight, quote, Biden's border bloodbath. Reporting from the White House, Iris Tao, NTD News. Former Trump Justice Department official Jeffrey Clark attending day four of disciplinary proceedings that could result in him losing his license to practice law. This stems from his efforts to challenge the result of the 2020 presidential election. Today, witnesses told Clark's attorney why they objected to the results. NTD's legal correspondent Arlene Richards has the details. Defense witnesses testified on Monday in day four of the disciplinary trial against former Trump White House official Jeffrey Clark. D.C. bar authorities charged Clark with attempted dishonesty and attempted serious interference with the administration of justice. The charges stem from a letter Clark drafted in the aftermath of the 2020 presidential election. It said the DOJ was investigating various irregularities in Georgia and had identified significant concerns that may have impacted the results. Clark's attorney questioned witnesses about their knowledge of the election process that year. Mark Wingate, who was a Fulton County, Georgia election official in 2020, testified that he voted not to certify the county's presidential election results twice for a number of reasons, including problems associated with the huge number of mail-in ballots. He said that he was told that the electronic signature verification system didn't work. Somewhere along the line, and I can't, I am sorry, I can't remember exactly when it was, but I had asked the question, well, okay, well, you know, what did we do for signature verification? And the comment I got back was, which frankly at that time floored me, was, well, you know, we didn't do any. On cross-examination, Wingate admitted that 147,000 mail-in ballots were processed manually. But he testified that he didn't know whether or not the signatures were verified. He said no one from the state or federal government offices ever questioned him about the signature verification issue. Clark faces potential disbarment over his efforts to challenge the 2020 election. On the stand last week, he repeatedly invoked his Fifth Amendment right to remain silent. Clark is a defendant in the Georgia RICO case filed by District Attorney Fonnie Willis. In other witness testimony, former White House liaison Heidi Sterup testified that she had some concerns about the 2020 election results. The night of the election, um, President Trump was ahead by, I don't know, 800,000 votes. And then the next morning, the election was declared in favor of Joe Biden. She says she spoke to the chief of staff for the Justice Department, who told her allegations of election fraud were not true. And she said that she was surprised to hear that. Clark maintains his innocence and says he's the target of a political takedown and the victim of a weaponized justice system. Arlene Richards, NTD News. The Israeli parliament passed a new law earlier today, allowing the government to temporarily shut down Qatari TV network Al Jazeera. Israeli lawmakers say the network uses freedom of the press to act as a mouthpiece for Hamas and could undermine national security. The White House responded, saying it believes in freedom of the press and is concerned about the new law. For that and more updates on the war, I'm joined by Alex Trayman, CEO and Jerusalem Bureau Chief of the Jewish News Syndicate. Alex Trayman, thank you so much for joining us. Great to have you back on the show. Thanks so much for having me. 
Now, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is vowing to shut down Al Jazeera, calling it a terror channel. Now, White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre is saying shutting down Al Jazeera's office in Israel is, quote, concerning to us. Now, you're actually in Jerusalem. What is the Israelis' people's sentiment towards this outlet? Well, they see uh, an outlet that is basically a mouthpiece of Hamas that has had Hamas members as journalists uh, in the channel. They saw Al Jazeera being broadcasting uh, Israeli military positions uh, because they had access inside Israel that uh, was then information used by Hamas. And even just last week, a story that was broadcast by Al Jazeera, which was later retracted quietly uh, that Israeli soldiers were raping Palestinian women, uh, which was a claim that was later uh, found to be unfounded uh, and, and quietly retracted. So Israelis definitely think that uh, Al Jazeera is working distinctly against Israel's interests uh, and therefore felt that they had the legal uh, means and authority to, to shutter the entity. Hmm. That is quite concerning. Now, over the weekend, we saw thousands of people take to the streets in protest in both Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. Now, this was the largest protest seen in Israel since the Israel-Hamas war began. How do you see this changing the Israel-Hamas war, given this internal pressure on top of all of the external and international pressure on Israel right now? Well, I think it's very dangerous. Uh, we saw mass protests uh, against uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu actually for years. Remember, we've had five elections in five years here in Israel. And then even after Netanyahu won uh, the last election, there were major, major protests in Israel against uh, his reforms that he presented over the Israeli judiciary. Uh, and uh, there were calls in the country for, for civil war, even though I don't think that there was any Israelis that actually wanted a civil war. Uh, but a, a tremendous sense of uh, divisiveness uh, at that time, which sent messages of weakness uh, to Israel's enemies and perhaps gave Hamas and others the sense that uh, Israel was vulnerable and open to an attack. So the idea now that uh, some of these protests would start again, uh, despite the fact that obviously many people have questions about uh, how any prime minister or any military could have allowed uh, October 7th to take place. Um, it's probably not the time for these mass protests and calls for an election as Israel is still fighting the war with Hamas and could potentially find itself in an even larger war with Hezbollah in the weeks or months ahead. Now, Israeli defense forces have said they ended its raid on the Al-Shifa hospital after killing uh, 200 terror operatives. Now, Palestinians have said that this caused widespread destruction in the area. But what is the Israeli view on the Al-Shifa raid? Well, we've seen over and over again that Hamas uh, not only uses uh, civilian buildings and residential buildings as uh, as uh, homes for, for weapons and, and tunnel shafts and others, but they also use schools and mosques and hospitals uh, to the extent that hospitals are even the command and control centers for Hamas in Gaza, specifically because the international community views hospitals as protected buildings that cannot be struck in war. But of course, if a building is being used by terrorists as a, a military base, it loses its protected status. And if Israel operated inside that hospital for days and killed hundreds of terrorists and, and arrested hundreds of other terrorists, uh, you can be certain that not only was this a place that Hamas was using, but that this actually was the central command of Hamas in the middle of Gaza City. Now, a top Iranian commander has been reportedly killed in Syria. This was an attack on a consulate there. Iran is blaming Israel for this. The U.S. and Israel have yet to confirm this news. Now, depending on who is behind this attack, how do you see that influencing the Israel-Hamas war? Well, Israel's continued to operate against Iranian installations, including uh, Iranian leadership inside Syria and also weapons transfers. Israel's been operating frequently there. Uh, just last week, we saw strikes uh, just north of Damascus and the Aleppo area, numerous strikes uh, over the last weeks and months on uh, the airport in Syria. Uh, anytime Israel thinks that they can take out top leadership of, of uh, Iran inside Syria, they are attacking. Alex Treman, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me. 
Turkish President Recep Erdogan suffered a major setback in local elections across the country. The Sunday elections were the worst defeat for his party in more than two decades. With most of the votes counted, Istanbul mayor and leader of Erdogan's main opposition, Ikram Emamalu, led by more than 10 percentage points in Turkey's largest city. His party also gained 15 other mayoral seats in cities across the country. In a late-night address, Erdogan called it a turning point. Analysts say he and his party fared worse than opinion polls predicted due to soaring inflation, dissatisfied Islamic voters, and Imamalu's popular appeal. Imamalu told his supporters the victory showed the country that, quote, those who do not understand the nation's message will eventually lose. The nation itself gives the order and the instructions, not just one person. Officials receive instructions from the nation. The period of one man rule is over. As of today, it is done. Addressing crowds gathered at party headquarters, Erdogan said his alliance lost altitude across the nation and will take steps to address the message from voters. In 2019, Imamalu dealt Erdogan a sharp electoral blow when he first won Istanbul, ending 25 years of rule in the city by Erdogan's party, including Erdogan's own run as its mayor in the 1990s. The president struck back in 2023 by securing re-election in a parliamentary majority with his nationalist allies despite a years-long cost-of-living crisis. Countering North Korea's cyber attacks, the U.S. is meeting with key allies to stop the communist country from extorting overseas businesses to fund its nuclear program. NTD's Jack Bradley has more from the State Department. The U.S. is meeting with South Korea and Japan to counter North Korea's cyber attacks. This comes amid reports of North Korea infiltrating IT companies by going undercover and then launching cyber attacks to then extort these companies and then fund its nuclear missiles program. Now the North Korean regime has denied these allegations. Diplomats from the three countries held their second meeting of a cybersecurity working group on Friday aimed at tackling this issue. North Korea has reportedly raked in about $3 billion in suspected cyber attacks, all to fund its nuclear program. And on Friday, the Pentagon formally established a new cyber policy office. The Pentagon has named the Chinese regime as the biggest threat to U.S. cybersecurity. President Biden signed an executive order in February aimed at protecting U.S. ports from China Chinese made cranes that could steal information and intentionally sabotage production. Regarding China, the State Department told me about their concerns regarding China's non-market business practices. According to the Financial Times, China recently introduced guidelines to phase out U.S. chips for the regime's computers. It could cost American companies like Intel and AMD billions of dollars. China has also restricted exports of precious minerals used to make semiconductors, a policy the U.S. has condemned. A State Department spokesperson told me actions like these by the Chinese regime disadvantage American businesses and workers and that they go against Beijing's claims that they are committed to a welcoming environment for foreign investment, open trade and rules-based market activity. The spokesperson said the State Department routinely engages publicly and in closed press sessions with U.S. firms to better address their concerns, including on these issues in our interactions with the Chinese regime. The U.S. continues to step up its actions to counter the Chinese and North Korean regimes and their unlawful monetary practices. Reporting from Washington, D.C., Jack Bradley, NTD News. A glimpse into Beijing's precise plan for invading Taiwan. Satellite images show the Chinese regime has built a mock-up of the most critical blocks of Taiwan's capital city. The training site includes Taiwan's presidential office and other government buildings. According to a Taiwanese defense analyst, Beijing's replica even features underground pipelines underneath the governmental offices. Let's take a closer look. Take a look at this satellite image captured by Planet Labs. A Taiwan town made in China sits deep in a desert in Inner Mongolia. But it's not a copy of just any town in Taiwan. The Chinese site almost directly copied Taiwan's administrative area, which includes Taiwan's presidential office and other important government buildings. Based on the satellite image, the site has existed for nearly 16 months. Taiwanese military analyst Joseph Wen pointed out Beijing's military is likely to use it to train troops on aerial bombing and gunnery and for simulating urban combat scenarios. 
He added this is at least the second mock-up Beijing has built targeting Taiwan's government district. The other look-alike is located inside a Chinese military training site also in Inner Mongolia. According to Taiwan Plus, Taiwan's military is mostly zeroing in on coastal defense training, with less preparation for what would happen if Chinese troops make it past Taiwan's coastline and onto urban streets. The former commander of Japan's Air Self-Defense Force, retired Japanese General Kunio Urita, told NTD that I don't think they'll opt for traditional landing operations. A more strategic approach will be concentrating on Taipei, seizing crucial bases, transporting around 6,000 to 7,000 troops at a time through helicopters to occupying these bases, then kidnap the next Taiwanese leader, employing threats and intimidation while at the same time spread false information, like William Lai defected to the United States to induce a collapse in Taiwan's governmental system. I think China will eventually pursue this type of military operation. The communist regime has never dropped its stance that it plans to take control of the island by force if necessary. Both U.S. and Japanese military experts have predicted that Beijing will be ready to invade Taiwan by 2027. And Taiwan's foreign minister says the island is preparing for a conflict with China in 2027. But is Taiwan and its allies ready to fight China's People's Liberation Army? But would U.S. forces defend the island? Yes, if in fact there was an unprecedented attack. President Biden has repeatedly said Washington would come to Taiwan's aid. Though his administration has walked back those statements, saying White House policy has not changed. Last year alone, Washington sent weapons packages valued at over $1 billion to Taiwan. So why would it be worthwhile for Americans to defend Taiwan? Experts say politically, the island helps keep peace and stability in the Indo-Pacific region. Economically, Taiwan is one of Washington's most important trading partners, largely because of its microchip-making sector. And culturally, Taiwanese citizens share a common goal with Americans, maintaining a free and fair democracy. California's $20 per hour minimum wage for fast food workers took effect today. That's after Governor Gavin Newsom approved more exemptions to the law. NTD's Jason Blair has more. On April 1st, a new law in California went into effect requiring fast food restaurants with 60 or more locations to raise their minimum wage from $16 to $20 an hour, with some exemptions such as bakeries. On March 25th, California Governor Gavin Newsom signed Assembly Bill 610, which adds more exemptions to the minimum wage law. There is a need to exempt additional restaurants from the definition of fast food restaurant, including such restaurants in airports, hotels, event centers, theme parks, museums, and certain other locations. Holden, who authored AB 610, said that historically businesses in these locations have established compensation and working conditions that exceed the standards set in the new fast food minimum wage law. Senator Brian Jones said that he wishes there were more exemptions to the new law, also known as AB 1228. You know, operators of all kinds of uh, restaurants in my district are, are really upset about 1228 and they think it's going to be a big problem for their business. And uh, I think we should exempt a lot more uh, restaurants out of this, or let's just undo 1228 altogether. Alex Johnson, who owns 10 Auntie Anne's and Cinnabon restaurants in California, said the new minimum wage law has hurt his operations. I want to do right by my employees, and I want to pay them as much as I can. But this bill, AB 1228, has really hit our operations hard. Um, we're no longer hiring. We're not backfilling positions. We're not growing in the state anymore. We're not expanding more locations. And I'm ultimately thinking about selling or closing my business. The exemptions outlined in AB 610 took effect immediately. Jason Blair, NTD News. And for analysis on the impact of this fast food wage increase in California, I'm joined by Jeffrey Tucker. He's a senior economist, economic columnist for the Epic Times and the founder and president of the Brownstone Institute. Jeffrey, thanks for joining us. California's $20 minimum wage for fast food workers kicked in today in over 60 chains. Now, what impact do you see this having on the jobs themselves, but also consumer prices? Uh, it's tragic overall. If 
if you don't fire your workers, you're going to have to pay them more if they're not already over the minimum and pass those costs on the consumer whichever way you possibly can. And as the person in your news report said, it means a less expansion of jobs and more franchise business quality. In general, some people will be closing the stores, others just leaving the state altogether. Uh, the, the impact on small business is particularly devastating because it increases costs uh, so high. And crucially, the only people who are going to benefit from this are the rich who are going to, uh, in a relative sense, be competing against fewer other workers. And the people who are going to be harmed are the relatively unskilled workers who are looking for that first job. This cuts off several rings of the ladder, so they have to leap up higher even to get onto the path of, of progress. So under the law of demand in economics, of course, you purchase fewer of the more expensive goods. Well, if you make labor that much more expensive, then business will be purchasing fewer of them and it'll cause you know permanent state of unemployment, especially for young workers or, or workers that with relatively fewer skills. Jeffrey, on that note, restaurants are now watching to see if they're next to keep up with a shifting labor market. Now, given the high cost of living in California, what needs to be done to help workers make ends meet without worsening inflation or cutting jobs? Well, this this new law needs to go. I think that gentleman's correct. I mean, it never should have been passed in the first place. And my own personal opinion is we, we don't need a minimum wage at all. I mean, business adjusts wages based on supply and demand. And they can't pay too low, or they won't uh, attract workers. And if and if uh, the government makes them pay uh, really high wages, then you're going to be excluding workers that otherwise would have been included. So it makes it's really super harmful laws. I mean, but California will not pursue the kinds of policies they need in order to uh, develop a, a growing business sector, and that's deregulation and tax cuts on businesses and and capital. And, and workers generally. It's the only way to attack uh, enterprise to the state. I mean, it's, uh, you know, the, the, the government of California right now, is, it's like some sort of death wish for prosperity and <clears throat> privileges for the rich. There's nobody else who's gonna benefit from this. And long term, it's devastating for the California economy. Jeffrey Tucker, founder and president of the Brownstone Institute. Thank you so much for joining us. It's my pleasure. And if you want to hear more from Jeffrey, he's just launched a new show on Epic TV called Freedom First. The show explores the assault on basic rights and liberties guaranteed by the Constitution, which Jeffrey says are now under fire daily. You can catch a brand new episode tonight on Epic TV, premiering at 7 p.m. Eastern. Convicted murderer Alec Murdoch was just sentenced to 40 more years in prison. The new round of sentencing is for 22 financial crimes, including stealing millions from his clients and law firm. Murdoch is currently serving two life sentences for the murders of his wife and son. Here's more. For the third time in just over a year, a judge will sentence Alec Murdoch to prison. That is the sentence of the court, and you are remanded to the State Department of Corrections. The once prominent, now disgraced attorneys fall from grace, a fixation in the true crime industry and the subject of several documentaries. Okay. Monday's federal sentencing likely won't immediately impact the current situation of the one-time heir to a low country legal dynasty, who theft and death seem to follow. I sentence you for the term of the rest of your natural life already serving two consecutive life sentences for the gruesome murders of his wife, Maggie, and son, Paul. Nobody, they're not, you don't want to open food. His dramatic six-week murder trial captivated the nation last year. We couldn't bring you any eyewitnesses because they were murdered. Prosecutors painted Murdoch as a desperate thief, living a lie in fear of being found out, who killed his own family to distract from a decade-long scheme of stealing millions from his clients, law firm partners, and other victims. I'm innocent. I would never hurt my wife Maggie, and I would never hurt my son Papa. It took the jury less than three hours to find him guilty. Guilty. He attempted to get a new trial this year when his attorneys claimed the clerk of court tampered with the jury, which the clerk denied. But a judge, while critical of the clerk's conduct, determined it did not affect the outcome. I find the defendant's motion for a new trial 
on the factual record before me must be denied, and it is so ordered. Murdoch maintains his innocence in the murders and plans to restart his appeal. He is also currently serving a 27-year state sentence. After pleading guilty in November to 22 counts of fraud and money laundering, prosecutors estimated he stole around 12 million from clients and his law firm. I hate the things that I did, and I am so sorry. A fraudster who claims he embezzled from vulnerable people to support a crippling opioid addiction, like the family of the Murdoch's housekeeper, Gloria Satterfield, who died after an alleged trip and fall at his home in 2018. Murdoch encouraged her sons to sue him, setting them up with an attorney who then worked with Murdoch to pocket millions in insurance settlement funds that her kids should have received. I really don't have words. You lied, you cheated, you stole. Um, you betrayed me and my family and everybody else. Now for your sports news, we're joined by NTD's Dave Martin. Dave, after a wild weekend of basketball, we're down to the final four teams left. Yet after a dominant showing, the question really seems to be, can anyone beat UConn? Yeah, it certainly does not look like it if they continue to play it like that. That was about as dominant of showing in the NCAA tournament as really as, as I've ever seen. I mean, they won the first two games in blowout fashion against lower ranked teams, so it was somewhat expected. But then what they did to San Diego State 30, uh, Thursday night, I mean, that was a blowout there in the second half, and San Diego State's a good team. But then they somehow won up that performance Saturday against Illinois. I mean, this was a 30 to nothing run midway through the game. You do not see that at this level very often against a very good team. Even more impressive to me is really how hungry they look still. Usually when you're the defending champs, you lose some of that or the pressure gets to you, but they don't seem to have that issue. They actually look like they have something to prove still. Now, of course, the odds makers are definitely on their sides. They are 11 and a half point favorites Saturday against Alabama in the Final Four. Now, the other matchup, Purdue is actually an eight and a half point favorite over NC State. Uh, so we'll have to see how they play out. Well, now looking at the women's tournament, we have a much anticipated Elite Eight game today between Iowa and LSU. Why has this matchup drawn so much coverage? Well, two reasons. One, this is a rematch of last year's national championship game that LSU won. So anytime there's a rematch the next year, especially in the NCAA tournament, it's going to draw some attention. But two, you know, there might be some bad blood between the teams. You know, at the end of that game, LSU star player Angel Reese, she might have taunted Iowa star player player Caitlin Clark a bit. I mean, usually when you do some gestures in someone's face, especially after winning, it's considered taunting. But the conversation about it afterwards kind of turned racial since Reese is black and Clark is white. Now, taunting, really, it's a matter of opinion. Most leagues have it, though. If you do some celebration in someone's face, that's actually crossing the line as taunting. Now, if that wasn't enough, after the game, First Lady Jill Biden actually invited both teams, LSU, or suggested inviting both teams, both LSU and Iowa, to the White House. People on the LSU side, though, thought that was somewhat of a racial bias since LSU is a more predominantly black team, Iowa is more predominantly white. Eventually, only LSU was invited, and they eventually came. But anyway, tonight, we finally have the much-anticipated rematch starting at 7 o'clock. Uh, shifting gears to baseball, the opening weekend is over with some star players who switched teams over the offseason making their debut. Have any of them stood out? You know, Juan Soto in New York, for one thing. You know, the Yankees, they swept the Astros. Soto had the game, um, really play of the game in the first game when he threw out the runner at home. That was a game time, potential game-tying runner. He's normally known for his bat. Now, he actually had multiple hits in three of the four games. He had a home run. He drove a run in every one of the games. He was very impressive that first weekend. Of course, this is a contract year for him, so everyone's expecting a big year. He will probably be the second highest paid player in the game after the season behind only Shohei Otani's $700 million, I would think. Now, another player who had a big weekend was that Japanese star pitcher Yoshinobu Yamamoto. He's the one who signed that $325 million contract with the Dodgers. That's the most ever given to a pitcher. I thought it was a very risky deal considering he never pitched in the major leagues. Anyway, after getting shelled in the opener like a week and a half ago, he was actually very impressive. Sunday, pitched five innings, didn't give up a run. Unfortunately for the Dodgers, uh, they actually lost the game, though, in extra innings. So. Well, now looking at the NBA, the LeBron James versus Michael Jordan debate has been re-sparked after LeBron scored 40 points Sunday at age 39. Now, he and Jordan are now the only two with multiple 40-point games at that age. 
Who would you say is better at this stage of their careers? You know, I'm going to say LeBron, and I really don't think that's controversial at this stage either. I mean, at that stage in his career, Jordan was actually coming off his second retirement. That was a three-year hiatus he took. The rust was clearly evident when he came back, and he was no longer on a contending team. He still averaged 20 or more points a game in those final two seasons somehow, though. Now, LeBron is well ahead of him in points, rebounds, assists, anywhere he ranks in those categories. Though I will grant that scoring is up overall in the NBA since Jordan retired 20 years ago. Now, both of them, of course, were no longer the same defensive player, um, which you would expect. Now, Jordan, though, he retired after his age 39 season. LeBron hasn't really hinted either way. I mean, he has said he'd like to play with his boys, or at least one of his boys in the NBA. But it looks like that still could be a couple years away from happening. Well, Dave, as always, thanks for joining us. Well, thank you, Tiff.